Thank you. Thanks, Steve. We're going to have a panel presentation um, with three folks from three different jurisdictions in Northern Virginia. So I'd like to ask um, Anita Freeman, who's the Director of Human Services for Arlington County, Rob Stalser, who is De Deputy County Executive for Fairfax County, and Barb Nowak, who is a registered nurse, a certified family nurse practitioner, and the health services coordinator for the Alexandria Public Schools to come to the stage. You will find their bios in your materials. Remember, we're testing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anita Friedman. I'm the director of uh, the Department of Human Services for Arlington County. I feel very honored to be speaking with this esteemed crowd this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know, let me just tell you about a little bit about uh, the Department of Human Services. My colleague, I'm sure you've, you're familiar with my colleague, Ruben Barghese, who's the um, Director of Public Health there. We are an integrated Department of Human Services, so um, we have everything from prenatal care for uh, immigrant families in our clinics to the issuance of death certificates. So beginning of life to end of life, and um, our privilege to have the behavioral health care services, public health services, child welfare services, housing assistance programs, economic benefits, um, services for the disabled and the aging, all in one shop. Nevertheless, we have the same challenges probably of most other communities in terms of um, maximizing the integration of those efforts to produce better outcomes for those who serve us. Now, you've all heard how our little affluent Arlington has uh, some significant issues, and that's what I'd like to focus on today. We're a community of 220,000 people, small 25 square mile community, uh, but we have about 60,000 clients who come to our department every year. So a quarter of the population of Arlington is actually receiving services through the Department of Human Services. One of my concerns is that uh, the way Arlington looks now, those folks are really becoming um, not seen by the larger public. We have uh, the, some of the demographics in Arlington indicate, of course, that we have an average median income of $100,000 per person. If you look at our demographic population chart, it has a big bubble in the middle. Uh, the largest group of of the population is between 25 and 40 years of age. And more people live in multifamily units than single family housing now. Nevertheless, n out of the 98,000 households that we have in Arlington, 20,000 of them are living at 60% of the area median income or below. And 10,000 of them are at 30% of the area min median income or below. And that's the folks that are accessing our services through the Department of Human Services. Um, by far above, I'd like to echo the sentiments of the gentleman who stood up before, housing affordability is the most pressing issue in Arlington. Um, housing has, affordability has de declined dramatically in Arlington over the last 12 years. The a number of um, redevelopments that have occurred has basically diminished the market rate affordable units available to low-income families. A household in Arlington, in order to afford a one-bedroom market rate apartment, has to make over $70,000 a year, or the equivalent of three minimum wage earner jobs, full-time jobs. Um, 
This is a real concern for us. It especially impacts seniors who are 65% 65, 65 of them are rent burdened, uh, racial or ethnic minorities, 57% of Hispanics are rent burdened, um, single family parent renters, 70% of them are rent burdened. It's amazing that, uh, and I would implore all the policy makers here to really put emphasis on this issue. You know, in Arlington, we give a lot more public policy attention to the, side of, to the size of sidewalks in new uh, high-rise developments than we do to the um, ever-increasing burden for these low-income households. Our department has a pretty robust housing assistance program. We have um, subsidized over 4,000 households with rental assistance in Arlington, and that enables us then to put more cash into the pockets of those households, which they can then use on um, medical care or food stability, but it's really not enough. So um, I think this is an ever-increasing need uh, for us in terms of um, even, in, even if we consider ourselves health care providers and health professionals, um, housing affordability is, I think, number one issue affecting Arlington in terms of the stream of poverty that's facing us. Good morning. Sorry, I'm doing an inadvertent Starbucks ad. I'll put that over there. Uh, my name is Rob Stalzer. I'm Deputy County Executive for Planning and Development for Fairfax County. Um, I have a number of things that are on my outline, but truthfully, after hearing the conversation this morning, there's so much I want to say. Um, I know I only have five to seven minutes, and I just used about 45 seconds of it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into it. I really hope that we get some um, insightful questions in terms of the, the comments that the panel makes. I want to throw out a few words that others have said today, but I also have in my notes that I think really encapsulate a lot of what I want to talk about. I think the concept of being upstream uh, is really important. Uh, Dr. Levine and I were talking before uh, the program began about being intentional. I think that is fundamentally important, whether you're on the policy and or the implementation side of what we do. I think thinking holistic we, that, that is a theme that has been recurring this morning. Leadership, fundamentally important, a word that's probably overused and not well understood. I'm a planner by training. I tell our planning and development folks, we don't, we don't plan to plan, we plan to do, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the work that uh, Fairfax County has done with respect to preparing our economic success strategic plan. It's a much longer name than that. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint to show you, but if you Google uh, Fairfax County economic success strategic plan, you will see the details of what I'm going to try to go through. Um, I think Dr. Wolf did a great job of showing you a lot of maps and data that um, Candidly, I probably couldn't describe as well as he did, and I think he really laid out some of the uh, basic uh, challenges that we have in Fairfax. And Fairfax is often seen as a, as a very, uh, and it is, a very vibrant, economically successful community. The challenge that we have, and I think most communities have, is that, and the analogy that I use with our governing body is, we're going to drive around the Beltway and look at our success, say, in Tyson's Corner through the rear view mirror, we're going to run off the road. We've got to be thinking ahead in terms of the issues and challenges that face us. Um, one of the statistics that I like to share um, with folks in the county, and we often forget this, Fairfax's overall population is about 1.1 million. We have folks, about 5% of our population is at or below the poverty line. That's roughly 60,000 people. That's the size of the city of Lynchburg. 
because of the size of Fairfax County, 400 square miles, and the types of communities that we have, that type of poverty and that type of uh, economic diversity or disparity is often lost in, in our community. Our economic success strategic plan allowed us to bring people together who would not normally be in the same place at the same time to talk about a lot of different economic issues. Candidly, there were some people who weren't necessarily interested in talking about some of the things that ultimately the board decided were important enough to include in their adopted plan. Underline the word adopted, very, very fundamentally important. Fairfax County's Board of Supervisors has never adopted a strategic plan focused on its own economic success. They've accepted reports, they've read reports, they've never adopted a policy statement. And for people like me, going back to the difference between planning and doing, being able to do is fundamentally more easily done if in fact we have that leadership foundation that we can operate from. Our plans focused on four things. I got one minute. Man, I got to hurry up. Uh, four focus areas. People, places, employment, and governance. We've talked a lot about people today. We've talked a lot about places. Most economic success strategies focus on employment and jobs and where those jobs are going to be located. Um, six goals further diversify our economy, create places where people want to be, improve the speed, consistency, and predictability of our development review process, um, invest in natural and physical infrastructure, achieve economic success through education and social equity, and increase the agility of county government. So I wish I had more time to get into more depth. Hopefully we can do that as a part of the questioning. But we have correlated very intentionally um, economic success and many of the issues that we're talking about today. And I appreciate the opportunity to share some of those with you. Good morning. I'm Barbara Nowak. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My presentation is a little bit different because I am one of those doers. I'm the boots on the ground dealing with this situation every day. Um, as my bio tells you, I've been working with Alexandria City Public Schools as a school nurse for five years. And just recently, I've been promoted to the Health Services Coordinator's position. And I manage a staff of registered nurses in our schools, and I function as a nurse practitioner to complete physical assessments for uh, some of our underserved students. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention reports that the academic success of America's youth is strongly linked with their health. The CDC goes on to state, quote, the education, public health, and school health sectors have each called for greater alignment, integration, and collaboration with education and health to improve each child's cognitive, physical, social, and emotional development. Alexandria City Public Schools, which I will be calling ACPS, embraced the CDC's recommendations and added a goal of health and wellness to their strategic vision for the future. And it's part of their strategic plan 2020. This plan calls for the development, implementation, and monitoring of effective programs that promote physical, social, and emotional wellness in order to maximize students' learning potential. It's a lofty goal and one difficult to attain with such a diverse population of children. The variety of ethnicities, incomes, educational backgrounds, cultural beliefs, and family structures make it difficult to measure success. But I think the best way to explain the impact of the health and wellness goal is to observe how my physical assessment practices have changed as a nurse practitioner since completing school health entrance physicals for our English Learners Registration Office. The students I see are uninsured and unable to pay the cost out of pocket for a physical exam. Oh, sorry. <laughs> their, uh, their school entrance would be significant delayed if ACPS did not provide this physical exam service. So please allow me to share with you how my practice has changed in order to meet the needs of my students and align with the ACPS strategic plan. First, my exam exchange because I have to ask parents about housing, in particular sleeping arrangements. My work as a school nurse taught me that we have children who attend our schools that are sleep deprived. 
and unable to concentrate because they sleep in the main living area of an apartment with multiple families. I've been told by a student, I couldn't sleep because my uncle was up late watching TV. Lately, one of my exams revealed that my patient lived in a two-bedroom, one-bathroom apartment with 13 people. The mother told me that she and her children sleep in the corner of a living room. I instructed the mother on the importance of her, student, of her child getting nine hours of sleep, and I actually gave her a flyer to put on the fridge to hopefully enlist the other inhabitants of the apartment's department with her. But it's hard to imagine the quality of sleep this child will get in this type of living arrangement. Another way my exam has changed is discussing food insecurities with parents. Before, I talked to parents about gun safety and their kids wearing a bike helmet. But now, I have to talk to them about food. ACPS has a wonderfully federally funded free or reduced lunch program that services approximately 65% of our students. I tell the parents about the application process and I also talk to them about food resources in the community. Children without proper nutrition are not healthy and hungry children are ineffective learners. I've started to be more careful in examining teeth. Over half the students I examine for the Yale office have poor oral health, which is one of the leading causes of school absenteeism. Poor oral health not only keeps children from being healthy and present in school, but it also affects their ability to learn. Painful teeth means a child will opt for soft foods rather than fresh fruits and vegetables that require a strong chewing surface, thus limiting their nutritional intake. Discolored or absent teeth cause a child to be socially withdrawn and can affect their ability to speak. Both social engagement and verbal communications are important to succeeding in school. ACPS is fortunate to have the WOW Dental Bus, a collaborative effort with Neighborhood Health, our safety net provider, that travels to various elementary schools. This bus has removed many barriers to obtaining dental services for our underserved population, but there's still issues with funding for those who are uninsured and unable to pay out of pocket. Not only do I complete oral health screenings, but also vision screenings. The Commonwealth of Virginia requires that all new students have a distance vision and coordinated eye movement screening within 60 days of school entrance. When working as a school nurse, I began to notice a pattern of near vision issues with some of our students from underserved pop families. When I first started nursing over 35 years ago, it was a rarity to find a child requiring near vision correction. Now I am observing an increased number of students that require bifocals as their first corrective lens. Even this morning, I had to assist a principal with getting near vision screening for a fifth grader who had dropped test scores by over 150 points, possibly related to vision issues. Another topic I discuss with parents is access to care, as we brought up many times. The school physical I perform allows the child early access to school, but it does not create a medical home. For many of my students, their primary care provider is the local emergency room. These services were never designed to provide ongoing medical care for chronic conditions. I talk to each of my families about getting health insurance and signing up with Neighborhood Health, our, the safety net provider, so they can create a medical home. In my work as a school nurse, I had students that demonstrated the symptoms of exercise-induced asthma. I would call the parents, I would ask them to take them to the doctor, I would provide a letter explaining the situation to the healthcare provider, and I re requested a rescue inhaler to treat the asthma issues prior to going out for recess or PE. But the parent would take the child to the local ER rather than a pediatrician's office. The ER may or may not provide the, the correct medication, and even if the child receives the rescue inhaler, there's no follow-up to be sure the treatment was effective. Not only was the strategy costly, but it was also poor medical management. I try to stress the importance of establishing a relationship with a medical home, but for many of my patients, this is a costly proposition that is likely last on their list of monthly expenses. So how can educational and public health community collaborate to help with issues related to the social determinants of health? I would advocate following the ACPS model. Not only does ACPS support my efforts to provide physical exams to our under, uninsured students, but they also support their wellness policy by providing a baccalaureate prepared registered nurse in the school nurse position in every school building. These nurses continue to work with the families to overcome unhealthy issues related to lack of sleep, poor nutrition, poor oral health, poor vision, and lack of a medical home, as well as managing minor illnesses and chronic conditions. 
Having an RN in every building allows for case management of our students with chronic conditions and provides a knowledgeable healthcare specialist who can treat self-management of their illnesses so that our students remain healthy and in, in school. Without school nursing resources, many of our children will carry their unhealthy practices into adulthood. By intervening in issues of housing, nutrition, dental, and medical access, we graduate students that are healthier, better educated, and become healthy, productive members of our society. If we ignore these issues, I'm afraid the future costs, both in terms of healthcare expense and lack of productivity, will be overwhelming to our society. Thank you. Thank you all.